Joining us today is Kathy Bumgardner. She is a veteran educator with a teaching career of 30 plus years, spanning a variety of grade levels, K to 5. Kathy currently is the founder and lead literacy consultant and school improvement coach with Strategies Unlimited, Inc. In her role, she directly coaches and works with schools, teachers, students, and administrators across the country in efforts to raise student achievement. Today, she will share real-world teaching strategies and successful research-based practices to promote and support high-quality teaching. Kathy, we're all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, this webinar is, of course, sponsored by McGraw-Hill Education. I want to thank them for making this all possible today. Uh, my name is Kathy Bumgardner, and as she said, I'm a consulting author with McGraw-Hill. And I'm also a consultant. And first and foremost, I'm also a teacher. And I'm very excited today to share some things with you. Uh, having been involved in balanced literacy uh, most of my career, I must say, probably in one form or another, um, I want to be able to uh, talk about some changes. I want to be able to talk about uh, things that are out there now that we can really rely on. Um, as you can see from the picture, Common Core is the elephant in the room, without a doubt. In every meeting we go to, every discussion we have when we're planning, when we're teaching, it, it all rolls back to Common Core. So we can't have a discussion about balanced literacy today without including the things that the Common Core uh, brings in. Uh, so you know, what does the Common Core classroom look like that supports a balanced literacy framework? You know, this, this webinar is going to try to focus on the pieces that make that up and support that and the strategies and tools that we can use to support teachers. A um, little quote from Todd Whitaker, one of my favorite quotes, that says, the best part of teaching is that it matters. And the hardest part of teaching is that every moment matters every day, which I know is something that, as teachers out there know, is something we struggle with every day. How do we use our time? How do we make sure what we're doing is worth our time? How are our students benefiting from that? And as school systems across the nation implement the new Common Core State Standards, it's more important than ever that educators obtain clarity around the components of balanced literacy and the instructional best practices that make this approach ideally poised to address the demands of the still new Common Core Standards in, the elementary, in our elementary classrooms. So, uh-oh, what now? Baby out with the bathwater. I know how we all feel sometimes when things change. You know, we are not throwing babies out with bathwater, but we are starting anew. And we're going to make sure that our best practices are those that fit. Balanced literacy instruction in the world of the Common Core and the 21st century. That's both digital as well as new and creative. So what exactly is a balanced literacy framework? Common Core is back map from graduation, so we know that we're talking about scaffolding here. So we're talking about a framework of instruction. We're talking about a framework of how we use our time every day. Scaffolding versus rescuing. Uh, balanced literacy is all about helping our students to understand the value of what they're learning and how to take that and extend it and sustain it to other concepts, to other texts to other experiences. And with the new Common Core standards stating that we definitely want to empower our students, this is an important point for us to think about as we talk about and plan for and implement instruction. So there are multiple versions and interpretations of what balanced literacy looks like. So for the next couple screens, you're going to see one that I'm sure you might follow or those that you definitely recognize. Uh, sometimes it's just semantics. Sometimes that's what makes it different. But if you can, as you can see, there's everything from four block, daily five, uh, reading workshop, cafe, uh, all those balanced literacy models that all have things in common but have a few things that are different. However, depending on which version of balanced literacy you're referencing, these definitely all include reading, whole group, small group, independent, basically reading to, with, and by. They also all include writing, whole group with guided, shared, interactive, small group, and paired and independent, writing for, with, and by. Also, depending on which version of balanced literacy we are uh, referring to or discussing, 
we know that they'll include a strong literacy environment, uh, classroom libraries, multiple texts available for our students, uh, teachers and students both using and creating anchor charts and having book boxes and liter literacy rich walls and areas and classrooms for students. Uh, lots of independent and group work, uh, workstations and materials and reading response and writing notebooks and journals. Those are things we quite often see in our balanced literacy classrooms. Social structures, buddy and paired reading and collaboration, all that support a comprehensive balanced literacy classroom. My goal for this webinar is to provide an overall conceptual framework of balanced literacy, and, uh, including all the ones we just looked at, and those methodologies that support it as it aligns itself to instructional practice and common course standards classroom. So the whole question is always why. I know this is a question we've all asked ourselves so many times. Why, we, why this big change? Why are we changing? Uh, so we're going to kind of spill the beans on what exactly we're looking at. We definitely know this. The bar has been raised. What are those shifts? What are those things that make a difference in our instruction? Um, as, as a balanced literacy uh, classroom leads on, we know that the bar has been raised. We know that there are more rigorous lexiles for uh, the Common Core standards and for the 21st century itself and life as our students lead on into their lives of college and career. Um, I guess one of the most important things to think about is that Lexiles is not the only factor, but it definitely is a factor. It deals with that complex, a form of that complexity of text. It is one of those things that we look at when we consider that. Uh, so we want to always be dealing with updated Lexile bands and understanding that we are using the right texts for our students and that we are providing them with those texts. And that our goal is, of course, to have our students to be CCR, prepare students to be college and or career ready at graduation. I tell teachers all the time, you know, this is how we are now evaluated. We are evaluated. Our teacher evaluations and observations are based on no longer so much on lesson delivery, but rather on student achievement. Are we preparing our kids to be CCR? Because it's a whole new world in which we live in and in which they live in and are going to continue to live in. You know, this is a great reason why. As you see, this is uh, a rotary dial telephone. Uh, many of us on this line right now know what this is, and none of us are on one right now. I, I would think not, but perhaps, I, but I don't think so. Um, but as you look at that, you know that that's not the world today. The world is a different place. This is what our students are used to. This is the world in which they live. It's, it's a very different world. It's a digital world, a world that has 21st century skills and expectations in order for them to be successful. You know, in order to thrive in an increasingly interdependent global society, students need to acquire a full range of 21st century literacies. And these literacies are essential to successful student achievement. Our students live. They were born into the world of Google. We have had the world of Google appear around us, so we have a different perspective of it. However, it definitely impacts our lives, and it impacts our instruction, and it impacts the balance of the classroom. So we want to make sure that we are preparing our students to understand the value of communication that the standard set out for them to do, and the collaboration piece, understanding that while they are learning to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, which is what our employers want, which is what our colleges want our students to come in with, those communication skills where they are collaborating together while they think critically and problem solve. In the same vein, we're also working on creativity and invention in the blocks in which we are teaching, in those, in those different areas that we're working with our students. Uh, we're preparing them to be globally aware and to know how to develop those filters to ask themselves questions and to ask questions around them and know what questions to ask and know how to be precise and accurate and to, and to have those resources and know where to find out what they need to know, which of course includes them understanding how to be information and technology literate. Um, the bottom thing on the left is the self-direction. That's the piece that impacts our instruction the most. We know that we want to prepare our kids to be prepared themselves. We can't go with them. We can't rescue them. We want to scaffold their instruction. We want to make sure that we're empowering our students and guiding them 
you know, I, I show this picture as well as this picture to say we are no longer Miss McGillicuddy, nor are we Helen Crump from Andy of Mayberry anymore. We have a different role in our, in our teaching world. Now the art of teaching is now the art of assisting discovery. It's not just teaching. We're helping them to get where they need to be. We're scaffolding and supporting our students in their deeper thinking, directly making that happen, modeling for them. The best teachers are those who show you where to look, but they don't tell you what to see. I love this quote. It absolutely sets out our plans that we need to be intentionally putting into place in our instruction to make sure that we are not telling our students what what, it, what the answers are, but rather leading them to those answers, empowering them to know where to find those answers and how to problem solve and work to get those correct answers. The new major role of the teacher is no longer the keeper and dispenser of all information. We want to say less so we can say it clearer, and we want to say what matters most so that we are empowering our students to be speakers and listeners who can survive. Also, understanding that we want them to be able to work together to teach each other, to be a classroom community, to know how to think that the teacher, not think the teacher is the only one who can answer all those questions, regardless whether it's whole group, small group, or independently. They're learning how and where to find those resources and to be savvy about that. Love this. This is the mantra to me. This is this kind of is the campaign campaign slogan for the entire. Uh, Common Core and the New World of Teaching, which is like read like a detective, write like an investigative reporter. You know, how do we get our kids to do that? The first time I saw this, I know that the thought that came into my mind was, oh my goodness, the hardest thing in the world to get our kids to do is to go back and reread. Wow. The next hardest thing to get them to do is to get them to go back and reference the text, show us where they found the answers. And that's exactly what this is saying, you know, making sure that what you say, not closing the book and uh, eyes going up to the sky, but rather reading like a detective, analyzing that text, checking those sources, seeing if, see where that came from, and to write like an investigative reporter, one that uses accuracy, one that is using the facts, that's not making things up. We don't want our kids to make things up. We want them to know how to find those sources that they need in order to be college and career ready. You know, how can we ensure that we have student achievement with the balanced literacy and the common core? Um, we're all, we should be asking ourselves those, those questions, and we should be getting our kids to ask themselves questions while they read. Because, you know, what do, what do great readers think? That's why several years ago when I came up with the idea of using Think Aloud Clouds with my kids to get them to see visually what the, some of those things we wanted them to think about and use their reader's brain, it was very important for me to have something that was not only uh, right there for them to touch and use and be kinesthetic, but also for them to understand how to think, to think literally so they could then think inferentially, so they could then think evaluatively. Um, comprehension and deeper thinking through close reading collaboration is a big part of Common Core, and it's also a big part of our balanced literacy that classrooms. So they're learning what good readers do and how they think and how they ask themselves questions, how they question the author, how they question things that they find in the text and go back and find out what those real answers are. You know, we're trying to develop submarine readers, um, not just those sailboat readers, you know, those little fake readers that skim the surface. They whip through books. They flip through books. You ask them what they've read, they don't know. You know, that's been a frustration thing for teachers for many years. We want to develop submarine readers who know how to dive deeply into the books and think deeply and to reread parts that need to be read and to read those things closely and to write down their thoughts and to annotate and to write, write out what their thinking is and where they got that um, source from and then discussing their thinking with others and being collaborative and communicative with others. The gradual release model that um, Fisher and Fry put out makes a lot of sense. And it's one of the things that, that I emphasize, you know, when I'm teaching myself and when I'm working with other teachers, you know, that understanding that we, those parts of understanding that we, I do, you watch it, we do it together, you do it, I watch it, I guide, you know, you work collaboratively. And 
you then they take it away to do it alone. We want to make sure that we have provided them with enough scaffolding that they are able to take that and do it on their own, and they will not need us to go with them to do it again and again, but rather understanding the value of meaningful repetition, providing them opportunities to practice that when we're teaching, whether it's in whole group or small group, when we're teaching, lots of teaching, lots of explaining, lots of modeling, and then giving them that opportunity to do that. Daily keys to empowering and building strong readers, strong writers, you know, reading, rereading every day, thinking about what they read, talking about it, writing about it, reading what they've written, reread other text, Think again, the whole cycle goes around and around, and that is definitely a key to building strong readers and writers and empowering them to be college and career ready. You know, so what does that literacy-rich environment look like? And how does the balanced literacy classroom support these things? The reading, the writing, the speaking, and the listening. You know, what are those things that, that teachers and administrators and literacy leaders are looking for? You know, we're looking for literacy-rich and student-centered classrooms who want to see their work. We want to see things that are there for them. We want to see areas for whole group. A balanced literacy class has to have that. That place where the teacher brings them all together to have that whole group discussion, that whole group modeling, that whole group shared and close reading. Uh, areas for small group reading and instruction. Areas for students themselves to be reading, collaborating with each other and reading on their own. Uh, another place besides just their desk, but having those classroom libraries, areas for students to work and collaborate, you know, during whole groups, you know, during those during that independent time. You know, basically overall we're looking for classrooms for scaffolding all learners because we have classrooms with diverse learners everywhere. One of the things that I do want to share that um, we have uh, through our new series of uh, wonders is that we have the balanced literacy teacher guides that take care, take into consideration all the things I've just been talking about. You know, what goes on during whole group, what goes on during small group, and what goes on during that independent time, and what are those resources they need. And one of the biggest things that I hear from teachers on a daily basis is, how do I find those things? How do I, how do I get all that together? You know, what type, what is complex text? Where do I find that? Uh, what, what is a good text for me to use? What should I be using with my group? What should I be using here? And this definitely can be a resource that I, and if, if you're not familiar with, I hope that you'll take the time to check out to see. So let's talk about what those groups look like, what those, what those components of balanced literacy are, that whole group. We're talking about many lessons. We're talking about shared reading, close reading. We're talking about shared writing and interactive writing. We're talking about read-alouds and collaboration, and we're talking about accessing complex texts in Common Core. We cannot ignore that in our whole group. And that close reading piece takes, takes a forward step as well, which makes the Common Core classroom and the balanced literacy components look so different now that mini lesson actually can be a mini lesson and not a maxi lesson. Is that possible? Yes, indeed, it certainly is. You know, the maxi overshadows the many, but we want to make sure that we're providing that. And the whole group mini lessons are also always going to have a balance of literature and informational text, because we understand that that is also a huge shift in our instruction. So during that whole group, we have opportunities to share those texts that are there and having a balance of how do I think, how do I, what questions do I ask, what are those things that I'm looking for in the standards an informational piece, and what are those things I'm looking for from the standards that I'm looking for in a literature piece, in a story, in a poem, in a play, and what are those questions, what are those text-dependent questions I need to ask, and first and foremost, what are those key details, and what am I looking for? Uh, the reading roadmaps that you see me holding up in this picture are available on my website, by the way, uh, which is uh, on several of these slides, as you can see, kbumreading.com, and they're there for download. Everything on my website is free, and they are teacher tools that they can use, and it's just things that enhance the great literature that we want to use. This is an example of some reading bookmarks that, that also have those same literary elements, 
and show how you think differently when you're reading an informational piece than when you're reading literature. Um, you can see the roadmaps that you saw me holding up earlier can also, I, I developed them so I can then flip them on the floor, uh, have the kids walk it, talk it, depending on what grade level I have at the time I'm using. They're either doing a retail or a recount or they're going deeper with the comprehension, and they're discussing these pieces of a text, whether it be a piece of literature or whether it be an informational text that they're reading. And we're actively engaging those students, and that's an important piece in a balanced literacy classroom is to en actively engage those students in that learning uh, to make sure they have opportunities to practice it in meaningful ways that will transfer and connect over to above and beyond the text that we're using there. I always tell teachers that our job is not to teach the reading, our job is to teach the reader. And you know, we want to make sure that we are providing them multiple opportunities to engage in that text and to understand it and to discuss it with others and be able to write about it and talk about it. I actually um, borrowed this slide from uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Doug Fisher, which says simply assigning hard books will not ensure that students learn at high levels. So we're talking about those complex texts that I know are a frightening thing for us as we delve into Common Core implementation. Um, so one of the things that um, Wonders does that I think is so great is that we have pieces in there where it talks about what makes this text complex. Teachers do not have time to go through all these texts, even once they find some or if they're given some, and figure out what exactly is it that makes this text complex. Because again, if we're always rescuing the kids, if we're always reading it for them rather than reading it with them and sharing with them, they do not get a chance to truly be able to understand it on their own. And that is definitely the goal for this, is we want them to be able to access complex text. And teachers need to know, what can I say? What can I, how am I scaffolding? How do I know if, I am, if I'm scaffolding versus rescuing? How do I know if I'm not telling them too much? And this piece can, is really a great part of Wonders that, that I did want to share with you as we discussed this, because it talks about what makes the text complex. And it's a scaffold to access that complex text that will not be rescuing, but rather can help the kids to bridge that understanding of how to how to enter into a text that has some difficulty there for them and how they can scaffold that. Um, so we're explaining here what makes this text complex. And as a teacher, I appreciate something like this that can show me, you know, what are the things I need to scaffold? What are some pieces in this text that I can go to to show them and explain without, you know, without giving away the whole uh, puzzle, but rather giving them a chance, again, as we talked about earlier, to, to we want to assist their discovery. Uh, we want to give them a chance to hear what we have to say, to listen to it, to teach them, to explain, to model, and give them a chance to take that away and apply it. One of the things that is an important part the Common Core now becomes an important part of a balanced literacy uh, whole group, small group, and going into independent reading as well is that close reading piece. Uh, as you can see here, Dr. Doug Fisher uh, says that close reading is a careful and purposeful rereading of a text. Uh, earlier in our um, webinar, I was saying that you know, we, we talked about how difficult it was to get our kids to reread and, and to understand that rereading is not negative. It's not a negative connotation. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you didn't do it right. What it means, what it's for, and what it means is that we're trying to get deeper meaning, that we're analyzing parts. We're finding parts that are great. I think of how many times I've, I've reread things myself or that I've seen a movie twice or I've seen something twice and I go, wow, I didn't see that the first time. You know, really getting that value, purposefully rereading it, not just because I told them to reread it. You know, one of the things that's on also, one of the tools that I have available are the, the close reading bookmarks that you see there that explain kind of like 
how do I do close reading? You know, with the pencil in hand just means we're teaching our kids, you know, how to mark certain things, how to know that everything's not important, but rather how to know what those key details are, how to know how to pull those key details from a text together to draw conclusions. And then as we move on up in grade level, we're learning then how to take those conclusions and roll them into inferences where we bring in our prior knowledge. You know, the fact that it is a it is definitely a, a challenging process to get our kids to accurately uh, make inferences about text and how to go in and reread pieces and look for patterns and word, the author's word choice and similarities and contradictions that the author uses, you know, key ideas and details along with craft and structure, along with the integration of knowledge and ideas where we're asking questions about those patterns that authors use and the word choice and what is the message and, you know, building up what is the theme and rereading for a purpose and, of course, looking for that text evidence. You know, we're talking about many lessons. We're talking about modeling. We're talking about showing them what that looks like, introducing it, teaching it, modeling it, guided practice, and then actively engaging them, having them to collaborate and learn together during that whole group. So it's not all about the teacher, but rather it's all about putting that out there and giving them a chance to take it and access it and model it together and go into guided practice before they go away to apply it. So the reading writing workshop is, is a great is a great place that teachers can go for those texts that they need for those close reads. It's a great place where they can have direction about the vocabulary, about the things that are involved there, about what the important points is they're teaching, you know, the complex text, the close reading, how do you access that? And how do we make sure that our students are able to take that and apply that to other texts? And we're modeling for them how to notice word choice. We're mo modeling for them how to notice those things that are so important in comprehension. Um, I, as you can see here, this is an anchor chart. Uh, my website is full of anchor charts. Uh, I'm a firm believer in them. I think if it's worth teaching, it's worth writing down either on a chart or on a smart board or to use a document camera or to put on an iPad. You know, I use, I, I make anchor charts in many different ways, but I am putting down my teaching, their learning, and then I'm allowing them to be involved in this as well. Uh, as you can see here, this is um, a first grade chart where students are learning to identify characters and key details, which is a standard, and they're looking, for, they're identifying these characters, and they're looking to see as they go back to review, what were those characters we found and what were the key details the text set up to make it up? Actually, those are key details that came from the text. So when I go to first grade and I'm describing what those characters are, then I will know, I'm not, I don't have to make it up, but rather I'll know how to identify what a key detail is. Which brings us to text evidence. Wow. I have to say that was one of the first things that really, as I said, blew me away was think how I'm, to get them to reread and reference text. So. I started just using little plastic magnifying glasses to try to help my kids to be, the kids I was working with, to help them to be reading detectives. And I found that, I don't know why I just did that, hang on. Um, I found that they really enjoyed that role, that they, that they would be able to um, go in and look at a text and value what it says and find the key details that give them those answers. And I don't know what it is about a square piece of paper with a hole in the middle of it that I then laminate after I cut the hole out and laminate it so that it has a little see-through thing. As you can see there on the right where the student is holding up the, um, the larger teacher size one against the text there. I don't know what it is about that square piece of paper that will get kids to be willing to find text evidence, but son of a gun if it doesn't work. And I think it's exciting when we find things that work with kids that get them to do those great things that make them better readers, that allow them an opportunity to revisit a text and know why they're doing it, and to deepen their understanding of it, and to understand where they locate key details so that they feel empowered to do so, and they're not so afraid of it. They're not afraid to go back in the text. Um, they're not afraid to go back into their own writing. Here you see an example of a student going back and showing me text evidence about 
what he wrote about and where he got that from. Uh, that's a valuable thing. Here you see a student coming up and going into an anchor chart and finding the text evidence that uh, from the answer they just gave me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to get them to be actively involved with that. Uh, understanding that text evidence not only comes from the text, but text evidence also comes from the graphics, from the pictures, from the illustrations. And I think it's exciting that um, that in our in our world of, of 21st century learners that that today they have opportunities to have so many rich texts that are out there that they can they can apply this to and helping them to understand the value of writing down their thinking as a writer as a reader and to be able to, to take notes I know that taking notes is definitely a hard thing to teach students. Having worked with middle school kids and high school kids as well, I can tell you that I know from personal experience that's one of the most difficult things in the world to get them to do is accurately and proficiently take notes. Kids tend to do one of two things. They either write everything down, they copy from the text, or they just don't write anything. They don't know what to do. So. You know, I, I got to say that I love sticky notes. I, I'm sure that I am in uh, I'm in good company out there with you. Kids will write things on sticky notes that write on other things, uh, and they do a great job of that when they're with us to write things on sticky notes when they can't write in the text itself. However, sometimes when they go away, you know, we find that they tend to not be quite as um, accurate or as meaningful on those sticky notes when they're not there working with us. So, you know, we can also work with having teaching them how to code text, how to put down certain little things that they can go back and reread and talk with others and then be able to write out um, their responses to text, which are so, so important. Uh, this particular one is on my website as well as several others. And, uh, and of course, I'm sure that um, many of you have seen many versions of these. I did not come up with these myself. These are think this is something that um, I had seen done and that I simply did, as good Dr. Harry Wong used to say, good teachers borrow ideas, great teachers steal and make them their own. And this is kind of what you always want to do when you've got students who definitely need a way to get that thinking put down without stopping. Many times when our kids stop to write on a sticky note, they will. Quit, they will quit reading, and they will simply begin to write and doodle and play. So this is a great way to have them to have specific things they might be talking about, uh, favorite parts, questions they have. There's many many types of codes that you can put down for that. You know, this is a little blurry, but you can see this is love. What was on page 22 made me laugh out loud. This student was able to go back and show me that part in the text on page 22 that. That he, why and why he liked it after he read it. And then he showed me the text evidence, and then he told me his thinking as a reader. And you know that was a much deeper response than I'd ever gotten from this child. So definitely worked for him. <coughs> Excuse me. Which brings me to the collaboration piece from the Common Core, which is also involved in all three uh, ways of whole group, small group, and individuals. You know, collaborative conversations from the Common Core, taking turns, listen carefully, talking, uh, listen, ask and answer questions, add new ideas, be open to all ideas, take on discussion roles, understanding that listening and speaking is that piece that pulls together the reading and the writing. And I love this little poster that I have that says, the look you give your friend when the teacher says find a partner. You know, so what I have found as an instructional tip in a classroom is that, you know, those first few weeks setting those procedures in place and having those partners, established learning partners, doesn't mean that's the only kids they talk to all day. It just means that when you're doing many lessons in that whole group and you want your kids to have someone that they are discussing what you're teaching at that point of, of importance, you know, rather than raising their hands, you know, and as I call them, their uh, Statue of Liberties, you know who our Statue of Liberties are, those that raise their hands before you even get out what you're going to say. It's a great way to go ahead and have those partners set, you know, the ways you know they need to be set, you know, 
whether it's you know whether you're keg and train and you and you put them together, you know, in a manner in which they're not so far apart yet they're not exactly the same, but they're able to work together. It also deals with chemistry and behavior and and tolerance of each other and chemistry. You know, these partners may change in five seconds or they may stay together all year. It would depend, but I like having those set in place so that that valuable time for those many lessons can truly be a valuable time for many lessons. This is an example of some of the tools that I also have on my website that uh, I, I've used to rehearse with kids because I found that they need to know what a listener looks and sounds like, what a speaker looks and sounds like, and how those roles change back and forth. So these little props seem to help them to learn how to be both a speaker and a listener. And this goes all the way up through the grade levels, by the way, not just for the preschool and the kindergarten kids, but all the way up. Uh, as you can see, these uh, are actually ones that have the text on them where the speaker might say, oh, I'm wondering about this, about the text. And then the listener could answer with part that shows that they've been actively listening. I was also wondering. Uh, I especially like the line where what I'm thinking is, and the listener says, I think I hear you saying, you know, that's just good communication skills. And truly, our kids can learn from each other. And it's so valuable. You know, our kids can learn up to 95% of what they teach others. You know, they're already learning 70% what they discuss with others, which is a whole lot better than just the 10% of what they learn when they read. You know, so, but that collaboration takes practice. It takes modeling. And here you see, this is, my, this is actually my daughter. And you know, it's fifth grade. She's got her fifth grader, fifth grade student in front of her. And she is modeling for the class how that collaborative discussion should go about the text that they've been reading. And then they get together. And they can be in pairs. And they're discussing. There you see the thinking code sticking out of the kid's book. And you know, they're sharing with each other what they're reading. In this case, they're, they're talking about the books they're reading on their own. But they can also be discussing that common text, the text that we're using in the reading writing workshop piece for the whole group uh, or, or in the, the pieces that we're using in the small group. It could also be a trio, as you can see. So that's the whole group, small group, you know, guided reading and practice, writing response to text, uh, collaboration and text evidence, again, in that small group, lots of instruction. But, that, but working with our students on their instructional level and being able to level up, that's the key. That is one of the most gigantic shifts that we have uh, with Common Core is understanding the value of leveling up, of not just making sure our kids do not stay in a low level, to make sure that we're providing text for them but that, and we're giving them a chance to practice with that, but also a chance to move up. Establishing purpose. What is scaffolded reading instruction? Establishing purpose, small group needs base. K2 addresses those foundational reading skills as well as comprehension. You know, grades 3, 5 focus on the comprehension a lot and increasingly challenging texts. And it can be used to engage students who need more support. You know, it's so important. Learning, reading, and rereading, thinking, collaborating, writing, conferencing, all those things are taking place, you know, in those small groups. But they're taking what we're teaching and they're, they're practicing that while we get a chance to interact with them. You know, small group reading, differentiate with level books at appropriate instructional levels, but accelerate with level up, which I want to share this piece with you from Reading Wonders because to me this is one of my favorite pieces, uh, how you can stretch to accelerate. You know, granted, we are using those texts that they, that they are their instructional level, but then we are also stretching them, you know, stretching them to where they can grow to, where they feel comfortable and giving them a chance to uh, level up to and accept to accelerate their progress, uh, to expand their knowledge. And I think that's one of the most uh, important things for us to think about in this, in this shift when we're talking about how do we make sure our small groups are valuable, that our kids are reading, that they're able to have an opportunity to be, to be guided through those, some of those complex texts as well and to feel comfortable with that. Uh, I wanted to share a little a question that uh, Dr. Tim Shanahan uh, did answer on our in our Common Core um, Toolkit toolbox 
on the website, somebody asked him, what are your thoughts about using uh, gradated text, text on a variety of levels as a scaffold? And I love his answer when he said, I think reading multiple texts on a topic written at different levels of difficulty is a terrific scaffold for dealing with harder text. In the past, if a text was hard for students, reading teachers would have encouraged using a different text instead. Uh, the idea here is not to flee from the hard text, but to read some easier in addition to text on the same topic and to climb these easier texts like stair steps. You know, therefore, I, I, I share with you these, which I think are great. You know, all of these are, are on the same topic, and yet, and they're informational text, and yet they have the same content, but they have level text, as you can see uh, there. And it allows our kids to feel all a part of that. They all have, are learning, and they're all accessing that text, and we're pushing them up to that next level and making them feel that they're empowered to do that and giving them an opportunity to do that in a way in which they can uh, acquire that, which brings us to the writing to respond to reading, you know, such an important part of Common Core as well in the way they'll be assessed, you know. Writing to sources, analytic writing, arguments and opinions, you know, teachers out there all the time that I work with are, you know, they're, we're always looking for ways to make that happen in a meaningful way. And one of the great things I think about Wonders is that there's writing included. That's why it's called Reading Writing Workshop every day, every week, every unit. Writing about reading, writing every day, focusing on the writing, on some writing traits and, and the writing process and understanding what writers do. Uh, understanding what 21st century learners uh, are all about and how that looks different for them, you know, and that whole balanced literacy piece. But some things are the same, but many things have had that shift upward to the rigor. So they can go digital and collaborate, manage and assign projects online. You know, that's one of the things that our, our teachers are struggling with. So, you know, we want to find sources to help them do that, and Wonders definitely has that um, so that you can t whether you're teaching with a hard copy or teaching digitally, you know, you have that there. Uh, I think uh, the Level Reader Database, that online access to over 7,000 titles, you know, that, that students can also access at home if they happen to have that, uh, that uh, way to make that happen. You know, all of those titles are, are, are out there and they can be pulled up and read online as well as, you know, um, on their computers and uh, in classroom libraries. Foundational skills, also a big part of that. Just wanted to throw this in to say that's definitely part of our whole group and our small group instruction in a balanced literacy classroom. Foundational skills, which brings us to the independent piece, last but not least, self-selected, collaboration, practice and application of all these things they've been learning. You know, wide independent reading, writing responses, meaningful act literacy activities, read, read, and read again you know, reading closely, applying that reading closely. You know, we've learned about it in whole group. We're, we've been practicing it in guided group. Now we're going to, uh, again, apply it in our independent reading and reading with someone, reading by ourselves, independent reading and writing, you know, and giving us a chance to conference. And, and in a balanced literacy classroom, that conferencing piece is very important. That formative assessment piece is very important. Uh, classroom libraries are an important part of a balanced literacy classroom. You know, reading volume still matters. It matters that they read. And students will read 40 to 6 percent more when classrooms are about engaging and reaching selections from which they can choose. And so, as you saw, there's you know we have all of those books that we have, and then again we have, you know, we also have those books I just shared with you that also go well in this piece. It gives them a chance to practice. Uh, with those texts that they, they thought were complex, but now they feel like they can access and they can go into their reading boxes and now they're ready to read and they have, they're, they're prepared to read at all times. They have multiple texts that are there and they can pull them out and read them and reread them with purpose and discuss them with others, you know, and do reading responses. Uh, just wanted to say that I um, also wanted to share with you a reading response rubric that um, my daughter Ashley uh, originally put together for her fifth graders uh, in trying to get them to understand how you respond to text. And this is also available uh, on my website. Um, a reading log, making our kids accountable. In balance there's a classroom, we want our students to be accountable for their reading uh, appropriately, but you know, by grade level, but we want them to know why they're reading, not just to keep busy, but in order to, you know, to, to grow their reading brains to expose them to different texts and to allow them to build their stamina and their fluency. And I give them that accountability piece. So, you know, they are accountable for what they're reading and 
as you can see here, that's exactly who fills these out. So basically, we're balancing the reading and writing, and we're balancing it through books and through digital. So final reflections, yeah, you know, if you have some questions, uh, I think we're going to take some questions. I also want to say, Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible till it's done. Well, in teaching, it's never done, but we definitely are making progress. So I just want you to say that, I just want to say that we can do it, and I hope that uh, some of the things I've shared with you today uh, can help you to uh, think about some different ways to make things happen and to think about what that balance of the classroom is. And another slide that I borrowed from Dr. Doug Fisher, which is, we, but we don't want to throw out that baby with that bathwater, but we definitely want to make those changes that we need to make it all happen. Thank you. Lindsay? Thank you so much, Kathy. If we have any questions, now is the time to go ahead and type them into the chat area. At this point, Kathy, we actually don't have any questions. You went over your presentation so well that um, wow. everybody <laughs> is, is left without anything to ask, I guess. Well, so I let's think I probably just talked a couple pretty minutes fast. to see if um, anybody has anything they'd like to go ahead and ask Kathy about. And so everyone knows, while we um, are waiting to see if anybody has questions, we will be providing a link to the webinar uh, by the end of this week. So you will be able to see that and view that. And if you have anyone that you want to um, share with this wonderful webinar, they will be able to do that as well. And I want to encourage you know everyone to if they have questions that they can also ask me through my website or they can ask me through the McGraw Hill website as well. We do have a question. Um, okay. Mara was wondering how do you feel about the daily five? Well, I'm sure Mara saw that I had daily five up on those slides earlier, and I you know I, I think I think it's a it's a great organizational tool. It's a great, that's exactly what it's a great classroom management framework. Uh, you know, that you can use to make sure that your students are um, doing whole group, small group, independent, that they have a chance to read every day, to write every day, to discuss and have collaboration with others. So I think this does any, any other framework that we have out there, we're all adjusting to those common core standards and the new demands of the 21st century. But, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a good framework. I've seen it work in many of the schools I work in. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Becky. How much time should be devoted for whole group? Well, now, whole group involves a lot of stuff, but let me just say that we're talking about mini lessons, and this is taking lots of practice. It took lots of practice on my part to learn how to do a mini lesson versus a maxi lesson, I think, uh, you know, when we're shifting over from, uh, you know, traditional teaching and uh, using whole text. You know, it's a shock sometimes, but I, you know, basically, a mini lesson is truly a mini lesson. I mean, that, we're talking like uh, a mini lesson can be 10 minutes. Sometimes a mini lesson can be up to 20 minutes. But pretty much, that's your mini lesson. You know, our kids can only take in. I think you take their age minus two on either side. That's how many minutes they can attend to what's going on around them. So I think the mini lesson piece itself, you know, needs to be about about 20 minutes. In, in that general area, you know, you hate to put times on stuff because sometimes, depending on what's going on in the classroom, you know, what your what your kids are like, or you know, if you're introducing something, or if it's a deeper text. But you know, general rule of thumb, we're really rolling towards the that understanding the value of a true mini lesson. Great. And our next question comes from Jennifer. As a new teacher, do you have any resource book recommendations for a fifth grade teacher that wants to start balanced literacy? Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I can't, right off the top of my head, I'll, I think maybe that's a great question, Lindsay. We may have to uh, take that offline and, and get back to her later. I don't have anything off the top of my head I could tell you right now, but, I, you know, there's, great. Um, there's some other resources that we could probably talk about. But Absolutely. I will tell you that Jennifer, the New Wonder please. series, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'll Jennifer, the new, we'll the go new... ahead and take your name down and yes. send you some more information afterwards. Our next question comes from Elizabeth. Do you have any advice for a reading specialist on how to motivate struggling students 
that hate to come to your classroom because they hate to read. Oh, breaks my heart, I know. You know, I've got to say that uh, a big part of a balanced literacy classroom is that self-selected, that opportunity. I think I said earlier that two reasons kids choose books. They choose books because they want to. And they choose books because they need to. And those are the books we coach them with. But we really want to find out, I think I've taken many a, many a child to, to the side and tried to find out what they're interested in and then tried to find text that uh, match that interest. Um, and I think that's getting them involved in reading about something they want to read about can definitely be a step towards getting them to read what you need for them to be reading. So I, I would just say, you know, those working uh, interest inventories are great. Uh, there's a lot of them online, um, and you know, if uh, you contact me later, I can I could probably share one. I don't think I've got one on my website, but I could definitely share one or two that I've used before. That you know, getting getting down the kids' interest is a great way to make that happen too. All right, Sophie has a question actually about high school English. She okay. teaches, and it looks like it would adapt well to her classroom, especially for her struggling readers. Have you had any feedback from other high school teachers about balanced literacy? You know, I have, and as a matter of fact, I have uh, I have I'm working with uh, currently, and I got to say that. You know, it was a huge, it was a huge uh, step for some of them to, you know, to start out with a quote-unquote mini lesson and then roll into having group, small group stuff and independent time with, their, with the students. And they, they now love it uh, because they're finding their kids are more engaged, they like it better. It also takes a lot of that pressure, you know, off of the, uh, the, stu the teacher themselves. You know, it's not always stand and deliver. So, you know, I, I think it's a, I think it's something that it's definitely uh, something that can work. Wonderful. When working with a small group of first graders who are reading at level A C, how can I conduct close reading? And that one's from Joanna. Great question, Joanna. Um, you know, with K-1, that's the difference in the close reading. You know, K-1, uh, close reading is done together. Uh, you're reading to them at first, and then you want to pull them into going back to reread parts with you. Um, and, I, you know, it, it definitely has a, has a deeper level of scaffolding with those K-1 kids, and especially those, you know, uh, emergent readers who are... Um, who are struggling, and you're, you're, but you're introducing them to text that they wouldn't be able to access themselves, and and through that, you know, I, you know, the Wizard of Oz is a great example of that's one of the things that's listed on Appendix B, and uh, I've used that as a read aloud, and then I also used a little portion of it as a close reading uh, with some first graders uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I love the response that I got from them because once I read through it, and then I went back and had them. You know, go through some of it with me. It was it was wonderful. So I think I understand that you it takes a deeper level of scaffolding, um, a different gender scaffolding with those K one readers, especially the ones that are struggling. Thank you, Kathy. And we have one final question from Christine. Okay. Okay. Would you recommend that book rooms be leveled by lexile levels? Um. That's a that's a tricky question, and I say it's tricky questions because there's there's reasons to have some 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 level sometimes to have things level so that you're choosing books that you that are that you're using for different purposes, but overall in a classroom library, um, you know my daughter who I don't know if she's still online or not, but my daughter can is a good example of someone who found the va who understands now the great value and, and did a great job with it of having your books. Uh, separated and organized by genre, by topic, by author, and having within those baskets uh, different levels of text that encourage the students to make choices, to know how to pick books that were right for them. And, you know, so it depends on what your, what your purpose is, but, you know, uh, for, for the sake of complexity of text and uh, the leveling up, you know, I, I think we need to know where those books, what those levels are, but we also, also need to know uh, that our students uh, need to be able to pick books that they both, as we said, want to read and that they need to read. I hope that I hope that was an answer. Um, you know, I, I struggle with that sometimes myself, but I know that those kids need to be able to choose books. 
out of a basket that, that are you know that are organized in ways that, that are not uh, re so restrictive to them that they feel like they can't choose books that are a little tough for them to try as well as sometimes dropping back to read something that's comfortable for them. Thank you so much, Kathy. We did have um, Mara add to what you were saying that she levels on the inside just as a suggestion. So yes, absolutely. Good. Thank you, Mara. Yes. And having it so you've got that information. That's the beautiful thing. Wonders has all of those, those levels, have the Lexile levels on there as, as well as some other leveling so you can tell you know, what those levels are. And when you're leveling up, you'll know what you're leveling up to. And, and as a teacher, I need to know those things. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. We want to make sure to respect all of our attendees' time and go ahead and wrap things up now that we've um, answered most of the questions that we've received. And we hope all of you have a wonderful and safe holiday. And thanks again, Kathy, for being our wonderful presenter today. And My pleasure. Great. And I want to thank everyone for attending today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from you. Great. And there will be an exit survey, so please, if you have a moment, go ahead and fill out that exit survey so that we can most appropriately follow up, answer any questions, and schedule future webinars. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.